Well, thank you guys uh, for joining me in prayer for our City Project students and just keep, uh, man, lifting them up to God uh, in your own time and with your MC. If you have a Bible, you can meet me in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27, Mark 8, 27 through 30. We're only covering four verses today, uh, but these four verses are some of the most important verses in the entire gospel of Mark. And the reason is that it is the very first time in the gospel of Mark that someone recognizes and confesses that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Now, many people think that Christ is Jesus' last name, right? Like Mary Christ, Joseph Christ, Jesus Christ, you know, like the Christ family, uh, which makes a lot of sense to understand that, but, but that's not what Jesus' last name is. Christ is not a name. Christ is a title, like Mr. President, Queen Elizabeth, or, you know, General so-and-so, and it's a title that meant Savior King, Savior King. You see, Jews in this day had a deep hope and belief that one day God would send a king, a Christ, who would overthrow the Romans, would deliver them from oppression, and make everything that had gone wrong right. And their, their hope in the midst of persecution and oppression was that this Christ was going to come and save them. And that can sound a little bit funny to us because we live in more of a secular society, but in reality, our longing for a Christ is deeply embedded in our culture. So I was thinking about the stories in our culture that have sort of lasting relevance, and almost all of them have a Christ figure. So think about um, Lord of the Rings, some of you nerds like me. Lord of the Rings has Aragorn, right? Aragorn is the rightful king who finally returns. He delivers the land from the evil oppression of Sauron, and he establishes justice in the land, right? So you've got a Christ figure in Lord of the Rings. Think about Star Wars. Star Wars has Luke Skywalker, right? The Jedi who arises, and because of his leadership and his abilities, the Empire is defeated for now, until Disney makes 14 more movies, right? So Star Wars has a Christ figure. Um, think about the Marvel movies. Every single Marvel movie is about a Christ figure. That's what all those heroes are. In their own little way, every one of them shows up and does for the people what they can't do for themselves. And in their own context, man serves as the Christ, the Savior, and the ruler that everyone needs. You see, I think that we resonate with those stories because deep down, we know that something is wrong. We know that something is wrong, and we're looking for someone to make it right. And sometimes we look to politics to make it right. And every four years, a new savior comes on the scene and campaigns for your allegiance. And we think, if, if we can get the right man or the right woman in office, then all the things that are wrong will be made right, and then life will be as it should be until it's not right? But we, we look to politics and we say that's where our Savior is. Some of us look to romance, and romance is our Christ. And every weekend, you're looking for a prince or a princess who can come drive the scourge of loneliness out of your kingdom, right? Like you think, if I could just find the right person, if I could get married, man, then I would be content. Then I would, man, have what I need. Man, other of us look to ourselves as our own Christ, and we say, like, I am my own savior. So I'm going to, man, look deep within myself. I'm going to discover my potential. I'm going to self-actualize, and I'm going to go after it. And if I believe in me enough, then I will be okay. Then I will be happy. Then I will be content. You see, the truth is, we all have a practical Christ in our lives. Every single one of us has a practical Christ. But the claim of the gospel of Mark is that Jesus of Nazareth is the only true Christ. We all have a Christ. The claim of the gospel of Mark is that Jesus of Nazareth is the only true Christ. He's the only one who can actually save you, and he's the only one who can actually make all the things right that are broken and wrong. And for eight chapters in the gospel of Mark, Jesus has been doing what only the Christ could do. I mean, he's been preaching with incredible authority and insight. He's been casting out demons. He's healed the blind. He's calmed storms. He's multiplied bread, and yet no one gets it. No one can see that he is the Christ. No one has confessed his true identity until this moment in the Gospel of Mark when finally Peter gets it. God enables Peter to see Jesus for who he is, and he confesses, you are the Christ. You're not just an inspiring example. You're not just a religious teacher. You are the Savior King that we have all been waiting for. And the truth is, friends, that to become a Christian, you must have your own moment like Peter. You must have a moment where you too confess that Jesus is the only Christ that can save you, and he is the only Christ who can make things right. Nothing else is going to do it. And if you're going to grow in Christian maturity, it means you increasingly trust in Jesus as your Christ and not everything else. You see, it's very possible to confess Jesus with your lips, but then trust in other things for your life. 
And to say, yes, Jesus, you're my Lord, but actually I need this candidate in office. And yes, Jesus, you're my Lord, but I need this much money in my bank account. And yes, Jesus, you're my Lord, and I need this many kids, and I need to do this well at school, and I need to have this kind of house, and if I have all those things, then I'll be happy. And part of what it means to grow in Christ is to realize none of that is going to do it. None of that is... None of that can deliver. Jesus is the only Christ. And so what I'm going to do in this text is just walk through it, man, explaining and applying as I go, and then at the end, draw out what does it mean for Jesus to be our Christ today? What are the implications of confessing that truth, okay? Look at verse 27 with me. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. So Jesus had been in the village of Bethsaida. Bethsaida was a small Jewish fishing village, home to three of the disciples, Philip, Andrew, and Peter. Bethsaida could not have been more comfortable for the disciples. I mean, it was Jewish, it was small, it was where they grew up. It was very, very comfortable. They could get their arms around it. So Jesus has been there in Bethsaida. Now he takes his disciples and he goes to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was not a place that good Jewish men went, okay? It was a Roman city that was infamous for paganism and immorality, they were probably surprised that their rabbi was saying, hey guys, let's go to Caesarea Philippi. It'd be like if I texted our elder team and I was like, guys, good news, got a couple rooms at the Bellagio, let's go to the Vegas Strip. You'd be like, why is my pastor inviting me to this Vegas Strip? I don't, are we doing evangelism? What are we doing there? You know, that's what, I mean, it would have been very strange. Why are we going to this place that we aren't supposed to go? You see, in, uh, in Caesarea Philippi, it was said that they worshiped the god Pan, Pan means everything. Pan means everything. You see, whatever you wanted to worship, you could worship it in Caesarea Philippi. It's kind of like Asheville, okay? Like, if you want to worship it, you can worship it there, right? If you wanted to worship politics, you could. If you wanted to worship, uh, man, beauty, sex, money, alcohol, you know, the arts, the sciences, the sun, moon, and stars, whatever you wanted to worship, they had it in Caesarea Philippi. The god of Caesarea Philippi was Pan. And this illustrates a really important thing that the scriptures teach us. When you stop worshiping God, you don't stop worshiping. You just start worshiping false gods. It's not like Christians are worshiping people and secular people aren't. Or like religious people worship and secular people don't. Everyone worships. Romans 1 says that man's problem is we have exchanged the truth about God for a lie and that we worship the creature rather than the creator. American novelist David Foster Wallace pointed this out during his commencement speech at Kenyon College. He said this, Everyone worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money, you'll never have enough. If you worship sexual allure, you'll always feel ugly. If you worship intellect, you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. You see, the truth of the scriptures is that we all worship. We all have a Christ, something that we trust in and that we serve. You see, the question is not, do I have a Christ? The question is, what is my Christ? What is my Christ? What is the thing that I trust in and that I serve above all else? And a good way to figure that out is to ask the question, what am I willing to sacrifice for? See, in the Bible, the words sacrifice and worship are almost the exact same word because they're so closely connected. So if you want to know practically what you're serving as your Christ, ask, what do I sacrifice for? Man, what do I sacrifice time and money and energy And health and family, what do I sacrifice for? If you're worshiping work, you'll probably go to work and sacrifice family time for work, right? If if you're worshiping romance, you'll probably, man, pursue a romantic relationship, even if it means you have to lower your standards. For me growing up, I worshiped football. And the way that I know that is I was willing to sacrifice anything if it meant me excelling in football. So what we learn is that it's, it's not a question of do I have a Christ? It's a question of what is my Christ? Because we all have one. So Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, the most immoral, dark place that he could find. Right? Why did he do that? Why did he choose that place to reveal his identity as the Christ? Why not do it in a synagogue? Why not do it in Jerusalem? That's a good idea. Why not do it like in a Christian bookstore? I don't know. Like, like why do it in Caesarea Philippi? I think the point that Jesus is making is this. I am the Christ in the darkest and hardest places on earth. I am the Christ in the darkest and hardest places on earth. You see, Jesus is not a tribal deity or a regional God. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, which means no matter where you go and no matter who you are with, Jesus is the Christ in that place. You see, in the ancient world, people believed that gods were regional and tribal. So there's the God of this tribe over there, and there's the God of this river valley over here, and there's the God of the rivers and the mountains, but there was no one 
all-powerful sovereign God. It was this big pantheon of competing gods. And, you know, we laugh and we say, oh, ha, ha, ancient people, they're so silly. We do the same thing today. I mean, the, the dominant belief in our society is that you are allowed to believe whatever you believe in your heart and in your home. What is that? In your heart, in your tribe, and in your home, in your region. Just don't act like your deity is the one deity above all deities. Just, no, no, no. All gods are tribal. All gods are regional. So like your God is the God of your house and of your heart, but he's certainly not the God of your workplace, and he's not the God of the city, and he's not the God of your university, and he's not the God of anywhere else you go. Your God is regional. Your God is tribal. And what Jesus is saying in this moment is, not me. Jesus is saying, I am the Christ in the hardest, darkest places. I'm the Christ in Caesarea Philippi. I'm the Christ in Jerusalem. I'm the Christ in Charlottesville. I'm the Christ in New York City. I'm the Christ in Mumbai, India. I'm the Christ everywhere because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And it's easy to affirm that intellectually. It's much harder to live that out practically. I have to be reminded of this all the time. I particularly had to be reminded of this when we planted this church. Guys, you have to understand, I used to serve as a pastor at a huge church, okay? Nine campuses, more than 300 staff members. They had 16,000 people at Easter this year. That's a lot of people, okay? Like, it was a massive church. It was very easy to believe Jesus was the Christ there. It's like, of course Jesus is the Christ. Look at how awesome everything is. And like, look at how big this is. And look at how many people's lives are being changed. You know when it was really hard for me to believe Jesus was the Christ? We moved here. And we planted this church, and I just felt so insignificant, and I felt so small. And I'd talk to people, and I'd be like, they'd be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, like, we moved here to start a new church. And they're like, oh, where is your church? And I was like, well, currently it's meeting in our basement. And they're like, oh, that kind of church, you know? Right? I just felt so small and so insignificant. And I, in my mind, I knew that Jesus was the Christ here. But in my man, it was like, is this, is it, he's the Christ in Raleigh, North Carolina. Is he the Christ in Charlottesville? And man, I've had, I've had to grow in that belief. No, he is the Christ here. And by God's grace, over four years, we've seen him do incredible things. But man, by faith, I had to believe that. Here's the good news. No matter who you're with, no matter where you go, Jesus has authority in that place. Now, you probably have an easy time believing Jesus is the Christ here, right? It's like, I'm preaching the word of God. We're worshiping. You're surrounded by people, mostly who, who affirm that Jesus is the Christ. And that's good. That's true. Jesus is the Christ here. Do you know where he's also the Christ? Man, where you live, where you learn, where you work, where you play. Everywhere you go, Jesus is the Christ. And here's why that's good news. The Lord Jesus is not inviting you to start something for him. He's inviting you to join him in what he's already doing. He's like, hey, guys, I'm already doing things for my glory among the nations and among the neighbors. Would you like to be a part of that? Like, I've got, I'm doing this. I've been doing it for a very long time. I'll be doing it after you're long gone. Would you like to be a part of it in your generation? I love what the book of Acts says about King David. It says that King David served the Lord's purposes in his generation, died, and was buried. I thought, man, what a great purpose in life. I just want to serve the Lord's purposes in my generation, die, and be buried. The good news is this whole thing called Christianity, this movement of the gospel started way before you, and it's going to keep going on way after you, and you get 70 to 80 years to join in. So, so God isn't being like, go and save all your coworkers. Go and save, you know, he's like, I'm already doing something. I'm the Lord here. I'm the Christ over this era, and I'm inviting you to join in. And I think that is both empowering and really, really encouraging. Verse 27b, and on the way, so they're walking to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do people, so what are people saying about me? So why did Jesus ask that? Was he like me as a teenager? Was he like really insecure? You know, like what are people saying? You know, what do people think? People think I'm funny. People think I'm cute, you know. What's she think? You know, no, I mean, Jesus, Jesus wasn't insecure because Jesus' identity wasn't built on the opinions of others. This is an interesting way to study the Gospels. Go through the Gospels and note down all the horrible things that people say about Jesus. It's unbelievable. I mean, if one of those things was said about us, we'd just wither. And Jesus just didn't care. The reason is that Jesus' identity was not built on the opinions of others. It was built on the declaration of his Father. See, early in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is baptized, and God the Father speaks and says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see, your identity will always flow from your Christ. You understand that? Whatever your Christ is, your identity will be tied to it. So if your Christ is politics, then you'll feel really encouraged and hopeful when your candidate wins and really angry and anxious when your candidate doesn't win. I just explained the American political scene to you. That's what's happening. My Savior lost. Ah, we have to freak out. My Savior won. Yes. It's like, nope, just person, right? Another politician. So if, if, you're, if your Christ is politics, then, you know, the, the ebbs and flows of your, you know, pr current party will determine the ebbs and flows of uh, you know, how you feel about yourself. If your Christ is romance, 
But then you'll feel, man, you know, desirable and valuable when you're in a relationship, and you'll feel really undesirable and, and really not valuable when you're single. Um, if your Christ is motherhood, then, like, you are going to ask your children to bear the weight of your significance. And, like, your children's behavior and how you feel like you're perform- performing as a mother will dictate how you feel about yourself. And that is a crushing weight for your children to bear. When Jesus becomes your Christ, here's what he does. He starts the lifelong process of divorcing your identity from your performance. The lifelong process. It takes a very, very long time. Because here's what you think. Don't act like you don't. You think you are what other people think of you. You think you are your last performance. You think that you are what you do, and Jesus is like, it's just not true. If you are in Christ, you know what you are? You are what God says about you. You are what God says about your identity. And here's the amazing thing. Here's what God says about your identity. Because of Christ, she is a child of God. She's been cleansed of her sin. She's not her past mistakes. She was made on purpose and for a purpose. I knit her together in her mother's womb. She is fearfully and wonderfully made. I've gifted her by the Spirit. I've empowered her for service, and I have good plans for her future. That is your identity in Christ, but none of you believe it. And I know that because neither do I, and I'm the pastor. What we believe is, I believe I'm my last sermon. I'm however many people attended last Sunday at church. You're how work is going. You're how much of a, you know, how, you're how good of a parent you are. You're, you know, how, what your friends think about you. It's just not true. So what Jesus wants to do is he wants to come into your life and divorce your identity from your performance and root it in the rock-solid foundation that is the word of God. Jesus did not care what people thought about him. That was one of the ways, reasons that he changed the world because he was like, you can say what you want. I know it's not true because I believe what God has declared over me. All right, so if Jesus wasn't insecure, then what is he doing? Right, if he wasn't, like, why are people thinking about me? What's he? He's doing what he often did. He was engaging his friends in spiritual conversation by asking questions. So if you read through the Gospels, you'll see he does this a lot. He draws people out by asking good questions. He says, hey, what do people say, you know, say about me? And then they start talking, and then he gets a little more personal after this. So, well, what do you say about me? This is an excellent way for you to have spiritual conversations with your friends. I think sometimes we overcomplicate like sharing the gospel and living missionally. We think we got to like have so much stuff mastered and we got to be like all super cool. It's like all you have to do is build friendships and ask people, what do you believe? Like, hey, did you grow up in church? Did you grow up with a religious background? What do you think about God? What do you believe about Jesus? That's a great way to just get conversations going. Just ask good questions and people, man, start to share what they believe. And if you do that, if you build friendships and you and you say, hey, what do you believe about Jesus? You'll probably hear something similar to what the disciples said to Jesus. Here's what they said. And they told him, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. So there was a lot of confusion back then about the identity of Jesus. So some people thought that he was John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was this really powerful preacher that came on the scene before Jesus. And people had a hard time keeping them apart. They're like, wait, is this the same guy or is this a different guy? Um, so this actually happens to Pastor Justin and I a lot. Uh, so sometimes I'll be out in the lobby talking to one of you, and I'll realize that you are continuing a conversation with me that you started with Justin. And so usually I'll just be like, mm, that's really good. Just email me at justin at centerofseville.com. You know, like, just break, you know, it's, are they the same guy or a different guy? I don't know. They're both pastors at that church. Um, so, that, so some people just couldn't tell them apart. They're like, ah, is this John the Baptist? Um, other people thought that he was Elijah or like one of the prophets. So Elijah was the most powerful of all the Old Testament prophets. Prophets were people who helped Israel know God better. That's what they, they were insightful religious teachers. And so that's what some people thought about Jesus. Oh, he's another prophet. He's kind of helping us know the word of God and man, how to relate to him in this season. So that's what they thought. Um, so what are, you know, what's the typical American think about Jesus today? Um, well, I, you know, I don't know what every single American thinks, but here's what I think is a general kind of flavor of what most American think, Americans think. I think most Americans think that Jesus was like a religious teacher who was ahead of his time, that he challenged conventional religious structures, he elevated the status of women, he advocated for the poor and the marginalized. He was a good man and a good example, and for the most part, what he taught is how we should try to live our lives and structure society. I don't meet a lot of people who dislike Jesus. I've told you, he has maintained a remarkably high approval rating over the years. Like most people like Jesus. I don't meet a lot of people who dislike Jesus, but I do meet a lot of people who misunderstand Jesus. Because if you understand that Jesus, you know, was a powerful preacher like John and and a miracle worker like Elijah, he, you know, he did challenge conventional religious structures. He did elevate the status of women. He did advocate for the poor and marginalized. But what's primary about Jesus is that he is the Christ. 
that he is the fulfillment of all the promises of the Old Testament, that he is the one that the Jews and the entire world had been waiting for and hoping for, the divinely anointed Savior King. And if you misunderstand that about Jesus, you misunderstand him entirely. Imagine someone came up to you and said, hey, can you tell me who Michael Jordan is? And you said, yeah, he's a guy from Wilmington, North Carolina, who played minor league baseball badly, right? Those are both true about who Michael Jordan is, but if that's all you told them, they would have a wildly misinformed understanding of who Michael Jordan is, right? Well, in the same way, if you understand Jesus only as a religious teacher, only as, man, an inspiring example, then you misunderstand who he is as well. So that's what was going on then, verse 29. And Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? But who do you say that I am? It's probably the most important question that every one of us answers. What do you personally say about the man, Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus turned it from the crowds, from what everybody else saying, and said, okay, Peter, okay, Thomas, okay, Thaddeus, what do you believe about me? You're following me closer than those other guys. What do you think is true of my identity? You've seen me multiply bread. You've seen me rebuke the storms. You've seen me heal the blind. What do you think all of that means? That's really the question that we need to grapple with. You see, we've said objectively that Jesus of Nazareth is the most influential person in history. That's not up for debate. (laughs) Have you ever thought about the fact that every time you write the date, you make reference to the man's birth? The calendar is divided by Jesus. It is. 2022 means 2,022 years from when we think he was born, right? Everything about our society comes back to Jesus. Everyone knows about Jesus. They might not know the right things about Jesus, but but he's one of the most well-known people that has ever lived. So the question is, why? What was it about him that made him so special? Was he just like a super insightful Galilean peasant? What do you believe about Jesus? Who do you say that I am? That is the most important question. And just so you know, everyone does not believe the same thing about that question. In fact, your answer to that question is what divides you into different religious groups around the world. So let me just give you an example of what different larger religions believe about the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Buddhism says that Jesus was an enlightened man like Buddha, but not God. Hinduism says that Jesus was an incarnation of God like Krishna, but not equal with the Father. Islam says that Jesus was a prophet who was inferior to Muhammad. Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus was the archangel Michael who became a man. Judaism says that Jesus was a teacher, rabbi, and failed prophet. New Age guru Deepak Chopra says that Jesus is a state of consciousness in our minds. That's true. Uh, That's what he actually thinks. I'm not saying that's true about Jesus. Right? So, like, what, what you believe... What you believe about Jesus matters. It is, it is the dividing line. Um, so two, two Mormon guys came to one of my friend's uh, house, and, and they said, hey, can we come in and tell you about Mormonism? And so they came in, and they were, they were arguing that Mormonism and Christianity are the same. And so they said, hey, you know, both Mormonism and Christianity value faith and uh, family, right? So, like, see, like, like, they're pretty much the same. And my friend responded, and I thought this was very wise and insightful. Um, she said, what do you believe about Jesus? Because it's like, okay, faith and faith, sure, like, lots of groups can agree on that. The question is, like, what do you believe about Jesus? Because at the end of the day, Mormons believe something very, very different about Jesus than Christians. Mormons believe that Jesus was a man who became one of many gods, was a polygamist, and the half-brother of Lucifer. Okay, that's what the Book of Mormon says, or at least it did say that. They may have edited it, okay? They, they reject the fact that Jesus is eternal, that he's co-equal with the Father, or that he has done everything necessary for your salvation. See, I'm not, I'm not trying to be unnecessarily harsh. I'm just trying to be clear that at the end of the day, what matters most is what you believe about Jesus. Family values, faith, yeah, those are important things. But what matters most at the end of the day is not any of that. It's what you believe about Jesus and everything else flows from that. Who do you say that I am? Verse 29b, Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Peter always speaks first and for the disciples because he was was the leader. And here's what Peter said. You are not just a powerful preacher and miracle-working prophet. You are the Christ. In Matthew's parallel account, Peter adds the son of the living God. You see, Peter understood that you are the one that we've all been waiting for. You are the one that we long for in our souls. You are the one who can save us and make things right. You are the Christ the son of the living God. To become a Christian, you must have your own moment when you confess that. 
Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Peter was the very first person in the Bible to confess Jesus' true identity, that you are the Christ. And every person who has become a Christian since Peter has done so by confessing the same thing. You are the Christ. You are the rightful king, and you are the savior of the world. So if you're going to consider that, if you're going to do that, what does it mean to confess that Jesus is the Christ in your life? Well, if he's the king overall, then that means Jesus is your king. We don't do well with kings because we've never lived in a kingdom, right? It's like, this is so hard for us. We're like, well, I want to vote for my king. You don't understand what a king is, right? <laughs> like, like, whatever the king says goes. It's not like, oh, that's an interesting point. I'll consider that. No, it's like, do it. Like, this is what you're doing. Right? So if Jesus is the Christ, if he is the rightful king over all the earth, that means he's the rightful king over me and over you. That means like his word is our standard. It's not like I do some of it, not others of it. It's like, Jesus, you have the right to tell me how to live my life. Like, I am not an autonomous creature. I live to serve you. I mean, that's part of what we mean when we say that Jesus is the Christ. You see, Christianity has always been a confessional faith. What that means is that Christianity has always had very clear beliefs and very clear lines. Like, this is what it means to be a Christian. If you're outside of this, you are not a Christian. And that does not bode well in our cultural moment. Because our cultural moment really enjoys gray. We really enjoy kind of fuzzy lines where we can kind of like be in and out. But just from the very, from Peter, from the very beginning, Christianity has been a confessional faith. This is what it means to be a Christian. And because of that, we're a confessional church. What that means is we have a confession of faith. We have a list of things that we believe. We, we can tell you about it at the weekender. You can find it on our website. And every member of our church has looked at that statement of faith. They've looked at that confession of faith, and they'd say, they've said, yes, I affirm this. I confess this. I believe this. And I know that that's not popular in our day and age. But at the end of the day, I think that is a really good thing, whether you are a Christian or not. So let's just say you're here and you're investigating Christianity. You're not sure what you believe. Do you know what you need from me? Do you know what you need from our church? Clarity. You just need to know what it means to be a Christian. You know what you don't need? 12 months of smoke and mirrors where you're not sure what we think about things. And you're like, I go there and they sing emotional songs and the pastor tells funny jokes, but like, I don't actually know what they think about stuff. Like, you, you just need us to say, like, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what the Bible teaches about these things, so you can investigate it and decide if you think that's true. You, you know, if you've ever bought a house, you always hire an inspector. Here's, you don't hire an inspector to tell you what color the countertops are. Do you know why? Because you know what color the countertops are. Like, you don't need to pay somebody a couple hundred dollars to tell you the color of the countertops. What you need him to do is, like, get under the crawl space and look at the foundations. Like, you need him to tell you, okay, how is this house built? What are the, what are the pillars upon which this house is constructed? That's what our confession is. You need to know, man, what it means to be a Christian. You need to know, like, what are the guts of Christianity? What, what does the Bible teach about God and man and sin and salvation? And what went wrong and how can it get fixed? And what does it mean to follow Jesus? Man, so that's what we try to do. We just try to be kind and convictional. We call it convictional kindness. We want to be kind and we want to be sensible, but we also want to be convictional and say, this is what the scriptures have always taught and this is what we believe. We are a new church that believes very old things. And I think that's what you need if you're investigating Christianity. I think it's also what you need if you're trying to grow in Christ. Because if, if you're going to grow strong in your faith, if you're going to be steadfast in the midst of, man, the, the current of our culture, you need to have some foundations. Man, you need, you, need to put, you need to put some foundations deep down into the scriptures and know what the Bible teaches. And you need to wrestle with the deep things of the Bible, like God's character, God's purposes in the world, God's sovereignty, sin, salvation, suffering. What is God all about in this world? And here's what you're going to find. It is going to blow your mind. And it is not, God does not fit in your box, and he is much bigger, and he is much more glorious and much more powerful than most of us tend to think he is. And it's uncomfortable for us, because it confronts everything about everything we've ever been told that the world is all about us. And the Bible's like, no. The Bible's unapologetically about God. <laughs> and when we try to read it when it's about us, it doesn't make any sense. But when you start to read it, and you start to see, man, this is all about God, you know what that does? It grounds you. And it makes you steadfast in the midst of a world that is chaotic. And it helps you know, like, hey, this is what the Bible teaches about these different areas in culture, and so I'm going to have to take a stand. And, man, when things kind of heat up and I catch, you know, flack for this at work or online or whatever, I can say, well, this is why I believe what I believe. This isn't a secondary topic. This is what the Scriptures say. I had um, a young professional pull me aside a couple months ago uh, and thank me for being just convictional uh, as a preacher. 
I said, oh, man, you know, that means a lot. Thank you. You know, you, is there a reason that, that you want to say that? And he said, um, he said man, I, I uh, experienced same-sex attraction. And he said, it has been so frustrating to go to churches who won't just be honest with me. He's like, I go to these churches, and I'm like, so is this okay or is this not okay? Like, what does the Bible teach about that? And he's like, I get all these vague answers, and it's all about your story and your perspective. He's like, I just need to know what the Bible says. Like, is this an okay thing for me to pursue, or, or is it not an okay thing for me to pursue? And he says, I'm so grateful because you have told me what the Bible says, so now I know how to honor God in this area of my life. And then I was so encouraged by this. And he said, and I know that Center Church is in my corner. He was like, I know that like, if I put a stake in the ground, I'm going to honor Jesus with this area of my life. And he's like, I know I'm going to get backlash about it. He's like, I know that I have a church that's going to be there for me. So guys, we, we need confession. We need conviction. We need beliefs. So if you're here and you're investigating Christianity, just know like Christianity has a box. It has strong lines. Man, when we lean into those things, man, they transform us and they bring the life that God created us for. So man, Christianity has always been a confessional faith. We are a confessional church. All right, so in summary, I only covered four verses today. Jesus takes his disciples to the darkest, most immoral place he can find. There he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter confesses, you are the Christ. The very first time somebody gets it, you are the king that we've been waiting for. And if you think about it, it's a pretty reasonable thing for Peter to confess. I mean, think about what Peter has seen at this point. He's seen Jesus like rebuke weather, right? Multiply bread, give sight to the blind, cast out legions of demons. So Peter looked at the evidence of Jesus' life and then confessed that he was the Christ. What we have the advantage of doing is we get to look at the evidence of Jesus' life, but also at his death and then his resurrection when we make our confession. And we can say, who else has lived a life like Jesus? Who else has made the kind of impact and influence that that Jesus has had over history? Who else would die in my place? Who else has conquered the grave? Who else has risen from the dead? Then we look at that evidence, and then we draw a conclusion. And we say, all right, this is who I believe Jesus of Nazareth is. I believe he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And if if you're here and you haven't made that confession yet, I just want to encourage you to investigate. You can just read through the gospel of Mark and just ask the Holy Spirit to give you eyes to see, to help you to understand, to give you faith. Because it is the most important question that we answer in our lives. Who is Jesus? And if you're here and you have confessed that Jesus is the Christ, I want to give you three ways that that should work its way out in your life. Three applications of that truth. Here's number one. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you should treat him with reverence, with reverence. We should seek to honor him with our lives. We should cease doing anything that dishonors him. If he is the king over all, then, then we should serve him as the king over all. Imagine if you, imagine if you went into uh, you know, the, the palace of the Queen of England. You probably wouldn't go in there like all disheveled, right? You probably wouldn't go in there all like, Lacks a day, lack of days ago, like you probably, oh man, like I can't believe I'm getting to meet the Queen of England. Like I'm gonna be put together, I wanna like honor her, and I wanna, why? Because she's a person of authority. I mean, how much more so should that be the case if Jesus truly is the Christ, the King of all kings, the one with authority over heaven and over earth? Um, what, what I've found is that many people have what I would call small God, small Jesus theology. So we have like this idea that Jesus is just like a slightly bigger, slightly smarter version of us. He's sort of like the trainer at your gym, you know? He's like in better shape than you, but if you worked really hard, you might be able to catch him, you know? Um, but, but what the Bible says is that Jesus is far more unlike you than he is like you. Like, when was the last time you brought someone back from the dead? When was the last time you rebuked the weather? Right? When was the last time you multiplied bread to feed 5,000 people? Jesus condescends to us. Jesus is a pastor. He's a shepherd, so he, he empathizes us with our weaknesses, but he is not like us. The biblical view of Jesus is that he is risen, that he is reigning, and that he is going to return. Just read the book of Revelation and be like, oh, that's Jesus. And you're like, I'm not messing with that guy. Like, we should have a holy reverence of Jesus. We need a big view of Jesus. Do you know what you need? You need a vision of Jesus that is bigger than your suffering and better than your sin. We all suffer. We don't all suffer in the same way, but we all suffer in some way. Some of you are suffering right now. You know what makes suffering way worse? Is narcissism. Because if your life or my life is all about me and my desires and my dreams and my purposes, then suffering is not only painful, but it shatters my purpose. So, so I'm suffering, and now there's no purpose for it, and now everything that I wanted out of life is gone because I've, I've got this suffering. But when you have a big view of Jesus, when Jesus Christ is your highest priority, when his glory is your desire, when his mission is your calling, man, when he is your greatest treasure, then suffering is painful, but it's not shattering. Because you can say, man, I have a Christ and a king who knows what it's like to suffer. 
and he empathizes with me in my suffering. Man, I have a Christ and a king who is my greatest treasure, so even if I lose every good thing in this earthly life, I won't lose the most important thing. And if your greatest desire is to become like him, then you, like James, can say, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, for the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You see, what we need in suffering is a big view of Jesus. We need a view of Jesus that is bigger than our suffering and better than our sin. Do you know what sin is? Sin is when we have a small view of Jesus. We sin when we choose the temporary fleeting pleasures of sin against the glories of Christ. So if you really want to grow in putting sin to death, you need a view of Jesus that makes sin less enticing. Right? I'm tempted to eat junk food when I haven't had a good meal. But if you put a ribeye and a McRib on a plate in front of me, it's not a hard decision, right? Because the ribeye is so obviously superior. Well, in the same way, when you see the glories of Christ, when you see his excellencies and his perfections, when you see his wisdom and his power and his character and his empathy, all of a sudden you say, I want Christ, and I'm not enticed by the small, temporary, cheap pleasures of sin. We need a view of Jesus that is bigger than our suffering and that is better than our sin. So we should treat him with reverence. Next, if he's the Christ, we should go to him with our requests. We should go to him with our requests. If he's the Christ, it means he is the divine king who reigns over all, and he's your personal savior. That the divine king who reigns over all left heaven and came to earth to save you. He is deeply invested in your life, which means we should go to him with our requests. The posture of our heart should be, Jesus, you are worthy, and I am needy. You want to know what one of the most pervasive sins in my life is? Self-sufficiency. I confess with my mouth and I preach every Sunday that Jesus is the Christ who's reigning over all. And then between Sunday and Sunday, I act like I'm the one who has to do it all. And it's up to me and my intelligence and my strategy and my ability to control things. And the Holy Spirit's just like, Josh, it's not. Like, stop acting like you're the Christ. Instead, come to the real Christ and say, I'm needy, you are worthy, help me. I need your wisdom to direct me. I need your spirit to help me put sin to death. I need you to help me be patient with my spouse. I need you to help me raise my kids. I need you to help me be bold at work and to be salt and light in that community. I need you to get up and another day, put the sin to death and pursue holiness. I need you, Jesus. I am needy. You are worthy. Jesus loves to answer those kinds of prayers. Here's the third thing. If Jesus is the Christ, it should produce readiness within us. Readiness. Guys, kings have kingdoms. Kings have kingdoms. And C.S. Lewis noted that this world is in rebellion against its true king. And when you become a Christian, Jesus brings you into the resistance. He turns you into an ambassador. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You see, if Christ is a king, then we are his servants, then we are his ambassadors, then we are his foot soldiers. Then our purpose in life is to advance his kingdom of light and truth and righteousness and to push back the bounds of the kingdom of darkness that encroach all around us. And we get the power to do that, and we get the energy to do that by reflecting on what it is that our king and our Christ did to save us. Because do you know what you were before you were a Christian? You were a rebel. You rejected God. You rejected his reign over your life, and instead of coming to condemn you, instead of coming to show you justice, to take you to the gallows, Christ went to the gallows on your behalf. This is what Philippians chapter 2 says about Christ. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, one day, every single tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. The question is, will you do it in joy or in judgment? Let me close with the words of C.S. Lewis. He said this, one day God will invade this world that he made. He will squelch the rebellion. And in that moment, it will be too late to choose your side. There is no use of saying you choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we have really chosen. 
whether we realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. Jesus is the Christ. And one day we will all confess that. So let's live our lives in the reality of that today. Jesus, you are the king. You're the rightful king of my life and of this church. You are the savior that we need. You are the one who can make the wrong things right. So Lord, we glorify you and we praise you and we thank you for dying in our place that we might have hope. We invite your power into this place. Lord, I pray for every person here who confesses you as Christ, that they would be reminded of your glory. They'd be encouraged and empowered to walk faithfully with you, to glorify you with their lives this week. I pray for those here or listening who have not confessed you as their Christ. I pray that you'd give them the eyes of faith, that they would see it, that you are the one and only one who can truly save them and can truly make the wrong things right, and that they would cling to you in faith. God, make us a church full of people who live out of our identity as ambassadors of Christ and who push back darkness in this world. We pray all these things for your glory and in your name.